Listen to a conversation between a student and her professor. Before we get started, I I just wanted to say I'm glad you chose food science for your major course of study. Yeah, it seems like a great industry to get involved with. I mean, with a four year degree in food science, I'll always be able to find a job.、Uh, you're absolutely right.、Uh, before entering academia. I worked as a scientist for several food manufacturers and for the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. I even worked on a commercial fishing boat in Alaska a couple of summers while I was an undergraduate. We'd、uh, we'd bring in the day's catch to a floating processor boat where the fish got cleaned, packaged, and frozen right at sea. That's amazing. As a matter of fact, I'm sort of interested in food packaging. Well, for that you'll need a strong background in physics, math, and chemistry. Those are my best subjects. For a long time, I was leaning towards getting my degree in engineering. Well, then you shouldn't have a problem.、Uh, and fortunately, at this university, the Department of Food Science offers a program in food packaging. Elsewhere, you might have to hammer courses together on your own. I guess I lucked out then. Um. So, since my appointment today is to discuss my my term paper topic, I wanted to ask: Could I write about food packaging? I realize we're supposed to research foodborne bacteria, but food packaging must play a role in all of that, right? Absolutely.、Uh, maybe you should do some preliminary research on that. I have. That's the problem. I'm overwhelmed. Well. In your reading, did anything interest you in particular?、Uh, I mean, something you'd like to investigate. Well, I was surprised about the different types of packaging used for milk. You know, clear plastic bottles, opaque bottles, cardboard containers. True. In fact, the type of packaging has something to do with the way milk's treated against bacteria. Yeah, and I read a study that showed how light can give milk a funny flavor and decrease its nutritional value. And yet, most milk bottles are clear. What's up with that? Well, consumers like being able to visually examine the color of the milk. That might be one reason that opaque bottles haven't really caught on. But that study—I'm、uh, sure there's more studies on the subject.、Uh, you shouldn't base your paper on on only one study. Maybe I should write about those opaque plastic bottles. Find out if there's any scientific reasons they aren't used more widely. Maybe. Opaque bottles aren't as good at keeping bacteria from growing in milk after the bottle's been opened or something. But where to begin researching this? I don't have. A...、Uh, you know, there's a dairy not far from here in Chelsea. It was one of the first dairies to bottle milk in opaque plastic, but now they're using clear plastic again. And they're always very supportive of the university and our students. So if you wanted, hmm, yeah, I like that idea. Listen again to part of the conversation, then answer the question. Maybe you should do some preliminary research on that. I have. That's the problem. I'm overwhelmed. What does the woman mean when she says this? I'm overwhelmed. Listen to part of a lecture in a theater class. As we have seen, the the second half of the 18th century was an exciting time in Europe. It was not only an age of great invention, but social changes also led to a rise in all sorts of entertainment, from reading to museums to travel. And finding himself in the middle of this excitement was an accomplished French painter named Philippe Jacques de Lutterbourg. Lutterbourg arrived in England in 1771 and immediately went to work as a set designer at the famous Drury Lane Theatre in London. From his first shows, Lutterbourg showed a knack for imagination in stage design, all in the interest of creating illusions that allowed the audience to suspend disbelief completely. He accomplished this by giving the stage a greater feeling of depth, which he did by cutting up some of the rigid background scenery and placing it at various angles and distances from the audience. Uh, another realistic touch was using three-dimensional objects on the set, like rocks and bushes, as opposed to two-dimensional painted scenery. He also paid much more attention to lighting and sound than had been done before. Now, these sets were so elaborate that many people attended the theater more for them than for the actors or the story. 
At the time, people were wild for travel and for experiencing new places, but not everyone could afford it. Lüterborg outdid himself, however, with a show that he set up in his own home. He called it the Eidofusikon. Eidofusikon means something like representation of nature, and that's exactly what he intended to do, create realistic, moving scenes that changed before the audience's eyes. In this, he synthesized all his tricks from Drury Lane, mechanical motion, sound, light, other special effects to create, if you will, an early multimedia production. The Eidofusikon was Lüterborg's attempt to release painting from the constraints of the picture frame. After all, even the most action-filled, exciting painting can represent only one moment in time, and any illusion of movement is gone after the first glance. But Lüterborg, like other contemporary painters, wanted to add the dimension of time to his paintings. You know, the popular thinking is that Lüterborg was influenced by landscape painting. But why can't we say that the Eidofusikon actually influenced the painters? At the very least, we have to consider that it was more, uh, it was more uh, of a mutual thing. We know, for example, that the important English landscape painter, Thomas Gainsborough, attended almost all of the early performances, and his later paintings are notable for their increased color and dynamic use of light. Luderborg's influence on the theater, though, uh, he was incredibly influential. The way he brought together design and lighting and sound as a unified feature of the stage can easily be seen in English theater's subsequent emphasis on lighting and motion. Now, the Eidofusikon stage was actually a box a few meters wide, a couple meters tall, and a couple meters deep. That is, the action took place within this box. This was much smaller, of course, than the usual stage, but it also allowed Lüterborg to concentrate the lighting to better effect. Also, the audience was in the dark, which wouldn't be a common feature of the theater until a hundred years later. The show consisted of a series of scenes. For example, a view of London from sunrise that changes as the day moves on. Mechanical figures, such as cattle, moved across the scene, and ships sailed along the river. But what really got people was the attention to detail, much like his work at Drury Lane. So, for example, he painted very realistic ships and varied their size depending on their distance from the audience. Small boats moved more quickly across the foreground than larger ones did that were closer to the horizon. Other effects, like waves, were also very convincing. They reflected sunlight or moonlight depending on the time of day or night. Even the colors changed as they would in nature. Sound and light were important in making his productions realistic. He used a great number of lamps, and he was able to change colors of light by using variously colored pieces of glass to create effects like passing clouds that subtly change in color. Furthermore, he used effects to make patterns of shadow and light, rather than using the uniform lighting that was common at the time. And many of the sound effects he pioneered are still in use today, like creating thunder by pulling on one of the corners of a thin copper sheet. One of his most popular scenes was of a storm. And there's a story that on one occasion an actual storm passed overhead during the show, and some people went outside and they claimed Luderborg's thunder was actually better than the real thunder. Listen to part of a lecture in an environmental science class. So since we're on the topic of global climate change and its effects, in Alaska, in the northern Arctic part of Alaska, over the last, oh, 30 years or so, temperatures have increased about half a degree Celsius per decade. And scientists have noticed that there's been a change in surface vegetation during this time. Shrubs are increasing in the tundra. Tundra is flatland with very little vegetation. 
Just a few species of plants grow there because the temperature is very cold and there's not much precipitation. And because of the cold temperatures, the tundra has two layers. The top layer, which is called the active layer, is frozen in the winter and spring, but thaws in the summer. Beneath this active layer is a second layer called permafrost, which is frozen all year round and is impermeable to water. So, because of the permafrost, none of the plants that grow there can have deep roots, can they? No, and that's one of the reasons that shrubs survive in the Arctic. Shrubs are little bushes. They're not tall, and being low to the ground protects them from the cold and wind. And their roots don't grow very deep, so the permafrost doesn't interfere with their growth. Okay. Now, since the temperatures have been increasing in Arctic Alaska, the growth of shrubs has increased, and this has presented climate scientists with a puzzle. Um, I'm sorry. When you say the growth of shrubs has increased, um, do you mean that the shrubs are bigger or that there are more shrubs? Good question. And the answer is both. The size of the shrubs has increased, and shrub cover has spread to what was previously shrub-free tundra. Okay. So what's the puzzle? Warmer temperatures should lead to increased vegetation growth, right? Well, the connection's not so simple. The temperature increase has occurred during the winter and spring, not during the summer. But the increase in shrubs has occurred in the summer. So, how can increased temperatures in the winter and spring result in increased shrub growth in the summer? Well, it may be biological processes that occur in the soil in the winter that cause increased shrub growth in the summer. And here's how: there are microbes, microscopic organisms that live in the soil. These microbes enable the soil to have more nitrogen, which plants need to live, and they remain quite active during the winter. There are two reasons for this. First, they live in the active layer, which remember contains water that doesn't penetrate the permafrost. Second, most of the precipitation in the Arctic is in the form of snow, and the snow, which blankets the ground in the winter, actually has an insulating effect on the soil beneath it, and it allows the temperature of the soil to remain warm enough for microbes to remain active. So there's been increased nutrient production in the winter. And that's what's responsible for the growth of shrubs in the summer and their spread to new areas of the tundra. Areas with more nutrients are the areas with the largest increase in shrubs. But what about runoff in the spring, when the snow finally melts? Won't the nutrients get washed away? Spring thaw always washes away soil, doesn't it? Well, much of the soil is usually still frozen during peak runoff, and the nutrients are deep down in the active layer anyway. Not high up near the surface, which is the part of the active layer most affected by runoff. But as I was about to say, there's more to the story. The tundra is windy, and as snow is blown across the tundra, it's caught by shrubs, and deep snowdrifts often form around shrubs. And we've already mentioned the insulating effects of snow. So that extra warmth means even more microbial activity, which means even more food for the shrubs. Which means even more shrubs and more snow around them, etc. It's a circle, a loop, and because of this loop, which is promoted by warmer temperatures in the winter and spring, well, it looks like the tundra may be turning into shrubland. But will it be long term? I mean, maybe the shrubs will be abundant for a few years, and then it will change back to tundra. Well, shrub expansion has occurred in other environments, like semi-arid grassland and tall grass prairies. And shrub expansion in these environments does seem to persist, almost to the point of causing a shift. Once it's established, shrubland thrives, particularly in the Arctic, because Arctic shrubs are good at taking advantage of increased nutrients in the soil, better than other Arctic plants. What does the professor imply when she says this? So what's the puzzle? Warmer temperatures should lead to increased vegetation growth, right? 